So I apologize in advance because this one's definitely going to be quite a long video um, because we have a lot to cover. So we've been spending a lot of time in line integrals, which is a single integral, which we could then turn into double using green serum. What we want to do now is we kind of want to turn that up another notch. So we're going to start by going through parametric surfaces. We're going to find surface area of a three dimensional figure. Um, and then we'll also talk about what a surface integral is, and then also go through and talk about um, how you can find surface integrals of vector fields. So it covers quite a bit of stuff. So we spent a good amount of time in the beginning of the semester talking about just surfaces in general. Um, we spent a lot of time parametrizing like boundaries of stuff, and we did do a little bit talking about how can I guarantee I'm on like two surfaces simultaneously. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just talk about how do I parametrize a surface to guarantee I'm always on that surface. So we're going to consider some surface S. which is defined by some vector function. In this case, when I was dealing with just a curve, you needed one parameter to define that curve. But when I'm talking about a surface, I have to be able to move in a couple different directions. So in this case, I'm gonna need two variables. So we need a U and we need a V. And I mentioned this before, but this is where it's going to get very important. You need to be able to distinguish between these two letters. So if you do not put that little foot on your U, it's going to make your life very difficult. Because if you have U times V and you can't clearly tell if they're different letters, it's going to be hard. Okay. So in this case, my surface is a three-dimensional object. Those components could be completely different things. So you have some function in the first component. You have a different function in the second component. And then another function in the third component. Okay. So essentially what's happening is there's some region that's defined by U and V that then produces the surface. So U and V can be completely different things than X and Y. So we'll have some UV plane. And then maybe this is our region R that defines the vector function. So every single one of these points is given by a U and a V. When we plug this into the function R, what results is a 3D surface in the X, Y, Z plane, our coordinate system. Okay. So every single one of these points maps to something which then gives me some three-dimensional surface. Maybe it looks like this. So this would be our surface S. Okay. So again, U and V give the edge coordinates of the vector that defines this. And this will end up being a point on the edge of the surface. Okay. If we do have a nice function where Z is a function of X and Y, so you can think of maybe like our cone or maybe the top half of the sphere, you can always go ahead and solve that for Z. Then you do have a very nice parametrization for it. Just like if I had Y equals X squared and I had to parametrize that, you could use T and then T squared. Same kind of idea here. So if we're given a surface, Z is some function of X and Y. Then the parametric form or the parametrization for this surface is the following. You can use your U and V variables 
in this case, U is representing X, V is representing Y, and then your Z is given by whatever that function is. Okay. Or instead, if you don't want to switch over to U and V in this case, you can indeed just use X and Y as your two variables. And then you're seeing what's happening in the XY plane to determine bounds when you need to. Okay. So we'll see some examples of this in the future. Um, but instead, what I'm going to do is work with a couple surfaces that I can't do this for. And we're going to see what is the parametric form or parametrization to be on that surface itself. So we're going to start with a cylinder. We're going to find the parametric form. Four, x squared plus y squared equals some fixed number squared. Okay. So this is a cylinder of radius A. Okay. So again, I can't solve for z in this. It's not very straightforward. But if I were to go ahead and graph what this thing looks like and then come up with that parametric form, I'm going to even draw in the negative cases in all of these. I'll make them dotted in a second. So we've got a cylinder of radius A, and it opens in the Z direction. Make this nice and straight. And in this case here, I don't have like specifications that my Z is fixed between two values. So technically this continues on forever. Okay. So this is my surface S, and I want to guarantee I'm on the edge of this thing, not inside the surface. I'm on the outermost edge at any given point. So essentially, I'm walking along this surface in any direction, and I'm finding a vector function that makes that happen. So in this case, to guarantee I'm on a surface that's a cylinder, I can just use cylindrical coordinates. So my X coordinate and Y coordinate act in a circle. And then my Z is basically free. It can be whatever it wants. It just gets to go up and down. Okay. So to guarantee I'm on the circle of radius A, our X coordinate would be A cosine of one variable, U. And then our Y would be A sine of U. So these two equations satisfy that x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared. Okay. You can use theta, but again, we like to use u and v for surfaces. Okay. So this always guarantees my x and y will be on a circle. And then to be able to go up and down forever, we let z be free. So it's just v. Okay. So this is essentially using cylindrical coordinates to parametrize the surface. Okay. So our vector function that guarantees we're on this would be a cosine of u, a sine of u, and v. And then I'm going to give some bounds because I don't want to continually go around this edge of the circle forever and ever and ever. Our u is taking the role of theta, so that's in between 0 and 2 pi. And then in this case, again, because z goes up and down forever, I don't have set bounds stuck between. My z is just a real number. So that indicates v is a real number. Okay. 
if I wanted the cylinder from say zero to five, then my V bounds would be from zero to five. Right? Let's try one more of these that again does not have this same kind of interpretation. And our first example that we're gonna actually find the area of that will have this nice format up here. But the second case I'm going to consider is how would I parametrize the surface of a sphere? Okay. So we're going to find the parametric form for x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals, and then in this case it's whatever your radius is, so we're going to make it arbitrary and call it a squared. Okay. So if I want to guarantee I'm on this surface, I do not need to draw a picture, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. So here we've got a sphere of radius a. So that's a, 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 and then it has all of that in the negative direction. And then you have the front of the sphere, the back of the sphere. You can make this complicated and you could parametrize the top half of the sphere one way because you can solve for z and get the square root of a squared minus x squared minus y squared. But then you can also parametrize the bottom separately because you would use the negative square root instead. And then to figure out what's going on with x and y, you go ahead and use what's happening in the xy plane to do that. But instead, the much easier one is if I'm on a sphere of radius A, just use spherical coordinates. So my x coordinate is going to be rho sine of phi cosine of theta. And rho is representing the radius, but in this case, because I'm on the surface, my radius is going to be a fixed number. So say you were dealing with a sphere of radius 4, you would have a 4 in place of a. The y-coordinate is similar. It is going to be a sine of phi, now sine of theta. And then our z-coordinate is rho cosine of phi. So this is a cosine of phi. And then to guarantee you're on a full sphere, remember theta is what's happening in the xy plane. So you're going fully around the circle. So your theta is restricted between 0 and 2 pi. And then phi is our other variable. In this case, phi is starting at the top half of the z-axis. It's how far you go down. And the most it can go is pi to get all the way at the bottom. So the bounds on phi are 0 to pi. Okay. So a vector function I can use to parametrize this surface is we'll switch over to u and v. The x-coordinate would be a sine of u cosine of v. And then it's a sine of u, sine of v, and then a cosine of u. So essentially, all these phi's got replaced by u, and so u is going to vary between 0 and pi. And then likewise, all the thetas got replaced by v. So my v bounds are 0 to 2 pi. Okay. And so this vector function will guarantee I'm on the surface of the sphere. So every single one of these points will be on the outer edge of that sphere. So our first goal is if you think about what we kind of did for line integrals, we started by talking about um, arc length, and then we saw, okay, well, what if we then bump it up a notch 
And it's now not an arc length, but instead we find a, a line integral of a function on the inside. And that basically gave us like the area of a curtain. So we're gonna do the same kind of process here. I'm gonna start by how can I figure out what is the surface area of this shape, in this case, the sphere, or any other shape that I'm working with. So what I wanna do is I wanna figure out what do I need to put inside of my integral, all right? So our goal is to calculate the surface area of S. Our first goal, I should say. So let's say S has an arbitrary function that's defining the surface. So let S be a surface defined by the following. We've got the vector function R, which has two parameters, U and V. You have some function in the first component, another function in the second, and then one in the third, okay? Where this UV is in some region R, or changes between some region. Okay. What I want to do, I know typically if I input a one on the inside, that will tell me what my volume is or area is, or in this case, the area of the surface. But I need to figure out what happens to that D something. So I'm going to start by drawing a picture and show you what we need to figure out. So we've got this surface here, and I want to know its area, but it's got a ton of curves to it, and we need to figure out what's going on. So in order to figure out the area, we're going to do what we've done before. I'm going to slice this in a bunch of directions. What we've done in the past is we've sliced it so that it's parallel to the x-axis and parallel to the y-axis. However, here, because I'm working with u and v, I'm actually going to slice it in the direction of that. So it might look a little weird on here, and I don't know exactly how my uv plane is oriented on this, but that's okay. But essentially, I'm going to slice this a bunch. Maybe this is the direction of what U looks like. And then I slice it another way in the direction of V. And maybe V looks like this. And so if I can find the area of a typical element here, then I can go ahead and just sum all of those up and it turns into that integral. So I want to figure out maybe on this little piece here, how can I figure out this area? So I'm going to blow this up and look at my typical element. Okay. So this thing is doing whatever it kind of wants, bending in each direction. This would be the change in the surface area, okay? So remember we did ds to kind of talk about the change in that arc length. Now I'm using a capital S to represent the change in that surface area. So instead of approximating this with some funky things, I'm gonna go ahead and use vectors to kind of help me out. So I'm gonna put a flat parallelogram on top of this that's roughly about the same size as this piece I've cut, okay? Because again, I'm not guaranteed that I cut this in squares or anything like that. All I did was cut it in the direction of U and V when these two surfaces were kind of intertwined together. So what happens is this one vector in this direction would be how I cut it in U. So this deals with the partial derivative of r with respect to u, and then the change in u. And this other vector over this way was in v's direction, and we know 
that would be a partial with respect to V. And then the length deals with dV. Okay. So what I can do is I can approximate the surface of these typical, the area of the surface of these typical elements by instead finding the area of this parallelogram. And if you remember, the cross product of the two vectors gives the area of the parallelogram. Okay. So I'm going to essentially summarize that right underneath. So we can approximate the area of the surface of each typical element by finding the area of the parallelogram. And the way we do that is we take the cross product of the two vectors. So I'm going to go ahead and cross product these and then I'm going to put it in magnitude because remember that's ultimately how we find it because the cross product will result in a vector but the magnitude of that vector is exactly the area because the magnitude also has to be something positive. So what that ends up giving us is the change in each of these surface areas, the area of that typical element can instead be found by taking RU DU and cross producting it with RV DV. Okay. And what these are is exactly the length. So it's the change in U and change in V. These are not vectors. So they're considered scalars. So what ends up happening is remember scalars can just pop outside of magnitudes. So this ends up being the magnitude of RU cross RV and then DU DV. Well, U and DU DV, that's what we've been kind of dealing with before. It's the change in the area in the UV plane. So we can say this is RU cross RV DA. So thus, what we end up getting, you're going to add all of these together, and then you're going to find it's a double integral because we have the two variables, u and v. So if I want to calculate the area of the surface of S, it would be I add up the area of all of these smaller pieces, take the limit, it turns into a double integral, and the surface is going to define the bounds. But instead, we can do this purely in terms of this vector function. So the inside becomes RU cross RV in magnitude integrated with respect to U and V. And then the bounds are determined by whatever's happening in the UV plane. Okay. So I'm going to show you just kind of how we get really a natural extension from what we've already done. So just to refresh, if you're finding the length of some curve C, it's equal to a single integral over that curve of D little s. And the way we went about calculating that was a single variable, so it was based solely on T, and we found the magnitude of R prime of T dt. So hopefully you can see it's a nice extension. It dealt with the derivative of the vector function that defined the curve. But for a surface, you need two variables. So you don't have single derivatives, you have partial derivatives. And then we still need to take the magnitude of a vector. And the only way I can do that is by taking the cross product of these two partial derivatives. Okay. So let's go ahead, let's try an example 
of this now. The first example we're going to do is we're going to find the area of the surface. which is z equals 1 minus x squared minus y squared. That's above the plane z equals 0. One thing that's going to be super important in a lot of these is going to be drawing that surface. So in this case, I do have z as a function of x and y, and we have graphed this surface a ton. And I'm going to go ahead, I have to worry just above the xy plane, so we can ignore the bottom half. So if you consider the surface, if you were to go ahead and find different traces in the xy plane when you set this equal to zero, you'd have to add these over. You have a circle of radius one when z equals zero. So in the xy plane, that's exactly what we have going on. This would be x squared plus y squared equals one and z is equal to zero. And then if I look at the other traces, if I let y equals 0, I have a parabola that goes through 1 on the z-axis and points downward. When I let x equals 0, it's the same thing. So I end up with two parabolas to be able to get this full picture. So this is z equals 1 minus x squared minus y squared, and this gives us the surface s, and I want the area of this, okay? So just thinking about this, this is a nice parameterization. We can use the vector function where the first components don't matter at all. They're just u and v because the only thing that dictates that I'm on this edge of the surface is this z coordinate. So my z would be 1 minus u squared minus v squared. Okay. Or instead, the easier is just using x and y. So our x and y are free for now, and our z is defined by exactly the function up here but I need to put restrictions on X and Y to guarantee that I'm not kind of going anywhere I want outside of here. So this is where I'm looking at what's happening in the XY plane to determine the most that these are going to go out. So if you had to leave this as U and V, you would have a UV plane instead. But here we're looking at what's going on in the XY. And so in this case, we have that circle of radius 1. Which occurs when z is equal to 0. So this region is going to help me figure out the bounds for my double integral. So this is the region R. So I have the restriction here that my X and Y have to belong in this region R. Okay. So what I'm going to need to do because the XY plane is, or what's happening in the XY plane is circular, it's going to make sense that I'm going to actually use polar coordinates to evaluate this double integral. Okay. So we have a lot of the pieces we need. So what we're going to do to evaluate the area of S 
it's the double integral over this region R. And this would be RU cross RV integrated with respect to U and V. But in this case, we just change those because again, they're just dummy variables. So this would be the partial with respect to X, the partial with respect to Y, and then integrated with respect to X and Y in whatever order, okay? So we're utilizing this one in this case because of the way I could parametrize this. So what I need to do before I just jump in the integral is I need to find these partial derivatives and then I need to take cross products. So starting with the partial with respect to X, that will be one in the first component nothing in the second. And then the partial with respect to x in the third is negative 2x. The partial with respect to y is fairly similar. The first component is 0, then 1, and then negative 2y. Okay. And then I need to take the cross product of these things. And just for time's sake for this video, I'm going to write out what it is, but I'm not going to go through all of the calculations. So we'd put Rx, which is 1, 0, negative 2x, and then Ry, 0, 1, negative 2y. And then go ahead and find this determinant. And if you go through this, you should find it's 2x, 2y, one. Okay. So I need the magnitude of this vector, which means that would be 2x squared plus 2y squared plus 1 under a square root. So this will be the square root of 4x squared plus 4y squared plus 1. So we are all set now to actually find our area of the surface. Again, it's the double integral over this region R and the magnitude of this vector we just figured out. That's 4x squared plus 4y squared plus 1. Okay. And then the region R, just to put it here, is what's happening in the xy plane, which is a circle of radius 1. So you absolutely could set up these bounds involving x and y, but it's polar. I might as well go ahead and just turn this into polar. So starting out on the inside, you could factor out the 4. You'd have 4 times x squared plus y squared. So this piece really becomes 4r squared. So the inside turns into 4r squared plus 1. And then remember, dA introduces something else. dA is r dr d theta. Our r bounds, this is a circle of radius 1, so that goes from 0 to 1, and then to go all the way around the circle, the theta bounds are 0 to 2 pi. And thankfully, at least, this is a separable integral. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta. And then the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 4r squared plus 1, r dr. First piece, super nice. Just going to be 2 pi. And then, again, for time's sake, because a lot of these, I'm going to trust you can do single integrals. This would require a u sub. But if you go through that process, you should see it ends up being 5 
to the 3 halves minus 1. So again, the bulk of this is going to be about setting up the integrals and getting them to a certain point. But if I have to go through every single one of these integrals, this will honestly be about a two hour video. And I don't wanna do that to you. So again, if you need to fill in those blanks, take the time, but I'm gonna trust at this point you could do a nice use of problem. So what I wanna do now is turn it up another notch. So instead of just finding the area, maybe the inside also has some other function that's in here. So that's exactly what we started with. This first piece is analogous to finding the arc length. Then we bumped it up to find a line integral, which found the area of the curtain dropped under some function. Now what I want to do is I want to figure out if I have a function inside my surface integral, how do I evaluate that? It's a very similar process, but again, it's a step up because it's a double integral. And this still does have a physical meaning. It's not as clear cut. Um, when we get to surface integrals with vector functions, that one's a little bit easier to explain. Right. So first I'm gonna go through the actual definition and then we're gonna go ahead and we'll do some examples of it. So to start out, Let's let S be a smooth surface. Defined by some vector function. Which depends on U and V. So the first component is some X function, a Y function and a Z function. where this U and V vary over some region. Okay. Now again, I'm gonna have a function inside of my double integral. So we're gonna call that F. So we need to let F, which can be a function of X, Y, and Z, be continuous on the surface. Okay. Now, assuming that I can go ahead and take partial derivatives of these things, we can define our surface integral. So if RU and RV are continuous, inside of R, lots of R's, but inside the region defined in the UV plane. And also when I take their cross product, it doesn't result in the zero vector because that would be boring. Because when you take the magnitude of zero, it's zero. So this would turn into an integral of zero. If this happens, then the surface integral of F on the surface S is defined by the following. Okay. We would have a double integral. The bounds are determined by the surface. And now instead of a one on the inside, which calculates area, we have a function. And then this is with respect to the change in the surface. But again, to be able to actually evaluate this, I can't integrate a DS. I've got to switch it over to these bounds dealing with U and V. And in that case, R is going to be determined by U and V and it will give me the bounds that I need. Just like we did with line integrals, we need to go ahead and replace this function and see what it looks like on the surface. So any of the X is going to be replaced by whatever function you have in the X component of the vector function. The Y will be replaced by the Y component in the vector function. And then likewise, the Z. 
So this will go ahead and turn this function into something that's just dealing with u and v. And then in the same way as before, the ds becomes the magnitude of ru cross rv. And then we integrate with respect to u and v. Okay. So to show you just the connection with surface area, because again, when we were dealing with arc length, we had a 1 and then a little df. And then this was a 1 r prime of t. It's still the same idea. So as a note, if the function on the inside is just 1, then the double integral over the surface will calculate the area of the surface. Okay. So the best kind of physical representation, again, is going to be for line integrals, it found the area of the curtain that you dropped. In here, maybe this function represents the mass of the object. And so if you're going ahead and you're finding this surface integral with a mass function, this or like a density function, um, this could find the total mass. The other thing that it's also really useful for is if you get into any type of machine learning, um, these kind of play a role in there because this is a way to kind of handle data on curved spaces. So if you have like images or time series, these can kind of pop up within that. So again, not quite a physical connection, um, but it still has very useful applications of it. Before we get into an actual example, again, I'm going to make this comparison from the one dimensional version to the two dimensional version, because the formulas are pretty analogous. It's just taking it from a single variable to a double variable. Okay. So for a line integral, We found the integral of some curve C, and we had a function of x and y in here, and we integrated with respect to the change in the arc length. What we did instead was we turned this into a single integral involving t. So you replace the x component by x of t, and the y by y of t, and then we had the magnitude of r prime of t dt. Okay. And then t ranged from a to b. And in this case, r of t is the parametrization, or you can call it the parametric form of c. Okay. So when I jump up to a surface integral, now it's a double integral over the surface. And this makes it so you can have a z component. And it deals with the change in the surface. Instead, this turns into a double integral defined by some region r. And again, in place of x, you plug in that function dealing with u and v in all of these components. Okay. So these just bumped up to multivariables. And now you can have a third component because the surface I'm working with is 3D. And then instead of r prime of t, because we have two variables, it deals with partials, and to get it to be a vector, we need to take a cross product. And then we integrate with respect to u and v. And so here r is a function of u and v. This is the parametric form or parametrization of the surface. Okay. 
So we're going to do a couple examples of these, and then we'll go ahead and talk about the last concept, which is going to be surface integrals of vector fields. Right? So the first example we're going to look at is we're going to evaluate the double integral of s, the function on the inside is xy, ds, where s is the part of the plane z equals 6 minus x minus y in the first octant. So I'm going to go ahead and draw this image first. So if you think about this piece, if you let x and y equal 0, then your z is equal to 6. If I then let uh, z and y equal 0, that would mean that x has to equal 6 as well. And then likewise, if I let this be 0 and this be 0, then my y has to equal 6 as well. So this ends up forming that tetrahedron, which we have found volumes of. But instead, I want the area of this piece of the plane. Okay. So my vector function I'm going to use to guarantee I'm on this plane is again nice because I have z equals. So you can use u and v, and then the z component would be 6 minus u minus v. Or instead, again, these are dummy variables, just keep it with x and y. Then to figure out my bounds for this double integral, because u and v are just x and y, I'm really just going to use what's happening in the xy plane. So this will give me that region of integration, r. Okay. So I'm going to define that one in more detail as well. My xy plane goes through 6 and 6. And then we connect the dots. And this is that region here. Okay. So the way we can actually figure this out is, again, you let z equal 0. So you get 6 minus x minus y is 0. Well, that becomes the line y equals 6 minus x. Or you can rearrange it depending on the order of integration you want to do. It's x equals 6 minus y. Okay. All right. So we're doing good. But what we need to evaluate is the following. We've got the double integral over the surface of x, y, ds. And at least in this case, if I plug in my parameterization, x and y don't change. If I had a z, I would replace it by this piece. So really, that's not going to matter at all for the first part. I'm going to use r to figure out my bounds. And then I need to go ahead and multiply this by Rx cross Ry. And then integrate with respect to x and y. Okay. So our vector function, I need to figure out all these different pieces. So I'm going to go ahead and start by figuring that out off to the side. So Rx will be 1, 0, negative 1. Ry is going to be 0, 1, negative 1. And then again, I'm going to trust you can do this cross product. 
it will end up being 1, 1, 1. So the magnitude of this vector is 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared is 1 under a square root gives me root 3. Okay. So this is a double integral. We've got xy, that becomes root 3. And then you can set up the order of integration however you want. I'm going to go dy dx. So again, just replacing this by root 3 and dA, we're going to use dy dx. So starting with the x bounds, that's my constants. My x is changing from 0 to 6. To figure out the y bounds, regardless of the x you pick, you start at 0 and go up to the line. So this will be from 0 to 6 minus x. So again, this can only deal with x. I don't want to have y in the bounds. And so at this stage, Again, I am going to trust you could go through this integral because you could go ahead and pop out this root 3. And you want to integrate from 0 to 6, 0 to 6 minus x. And then it is a nice polynomial that you're just finding the antiderivative of and then plugging in stuff. If you go through this all, you should see this is equal to 54 root 3. Okay. So let's try another one of these. And this one will not be as nice as these others. I can't just use x, y, and then whatever. We're going to find a surface integral where our sphere is the bounds. So this is where I need to use spherical coordinates, which is what we did before. So here we're going to evaluate the double integral over the surface s of 1 minus x squared minus y squared ds, where s is the sphere, x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals 1. drawing my surface just to have that picture. We got our sphere of radius 1. And then you got the front of the sphere and the back of the sphere. So we can parameterize the surface using spherical coordinates. So remember our x is equal to rho, which in this case is a radius 1. And then we've got sine of phi, cosine of theta. So I'm going to use u and v. My y coordinate is similar, but it becomes sine of v. And then my z is given by cosine of u. Okay. My u is representing the phi, so this is how u is moving. Your u varies between 0 and pi to get all the way down to the bottom. And then my v is representing theta. That will be how we move in the xy direction. So let me just label these to make it a little bit easier. So in this case, to go all the way around, my v will vary between 0 and 2 pi. So this is nice because at least then my u and v bounds are constant bounds. So if you want to figure out this region R, it's just going to be constants. 
So to show you what's happening in the UV plane is my U goes out to 2 pi. Oh, sorry, wrong one. My U goes out to pi, and my V goes out to 2 pi. Looking at it backwards. So U will vary between these constants and V varies between these constants. So this is my region R, which is a nice rectangular region. Okay. And the vector function we're using is sine of U, cosine of V, sine of U, sine of V, and I need to move this over a little bit, my Z is cosine of U, where UV is again in this rectangular region R. Okay. So I need to do a couple things. I need to definitely find the partial with respect to u. So in this case, that means differentiating these three functions, leaving what's attached. Derivative of sine of u is cosine of u. Same thing, derivative of sine is cosine. And then derivative of cosine is negative sine. Then the partial with respect to V is now instead I am differentiating these two pieces and thankfully at least the third is nothing. So this becomes negative sine of U sine of V. Then it's sine of U cosine of V and zero. So this one, the cross product is a little bit messy. I'm not going to go through the full details of actually writing out that matrix, but I still will at least show you just from here how to go ahead and calculate RU cross RB. So if you think about it, these vectors are already in order and they're all pretty aligned as is. So all that would happen is you would put your I, J, K up here. So when I go to evaluate the first component, you would strike out the i, j, and k, and then you'd strike out this first column. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that directly on here. We would take the product minus the product. And thankfully, at least the first one is zero. So you really just get this off diagonal, and it would be negative of the product. So this turns into positive sine squared of u, cosine of v. Okay. Then in the middle piece, I know I automatically have to put that minus sign. And in this case now, I would go ahead and I would strike out the middle column. And then again, I would do the product, which is zero, then minus this product. Okay. So I'm going to subtract this quantity. The negative negative cancels out, but still I'm subtracting the overall product, which results in sine squared of u sine of v. Then for my third component, this one is not as nice because you would strike out the zero, which stinks. And I'd have to do this product. So combining those like pieces, I just have cosine of V times cosine of V. And this is going to be a big one, so I'm going to put this on two lines. This ends up being cosine of U, sine of U, times cosine squared of V. And then I need to subtract this product. So thankfully, at least turns into a plus because we're subtracting a negative. And then in the same way, I've just got sine of V times sine of V as the like pieces. 
So this becomes plus cosine of u, sine of u, and then sine squared of v. Now we can see if this simplifies a little bit, and thankfully, because these both have cosine of u, sine of u, I could factor that out. And what you're left with then is cosine squared of v plus sine squared of v. So that will end up equaling 1 because it's the same angle on the inside. Okay. So this ultimately becomes sine squared of u, cosine of v, sine squared of u, sine of v. And then in that third component, you factored out the cosine of u, sine of u, and then the rest condensed to 1. So still not pretty because I have to take the magnitude of this thing. And I sure hope that it simplifies a ton. Okay. So I have to take the first component and square it, which ends up giving me sine to the fourth of u cosine squared of v. Then I add the next one, which gives me sine to the fourth of u, sine squared of v. And then in here, cosine squared of u, sine squared of u. And all of this is under a radical. So we can do some simplification to start. These first ones both have sine to the fourth of u. And then what's left over is cosine squared of v plus sine squared of v, so same angle. So at least in that case, this condenses just to sine to the fourth of u, because those become one. And then we've got cosine squared of u, sine squared of u. Then here I can do even more factoring. So these both can have a sine squared of u taken out. So what's left from the first piece is sine squared of u. From the second piece is cosine squared of u. And then that's really nice because that just equals 1. So this boils down very nicely into the square root of sine squared of u. Now remember, you do have to be careful when you take a square root because it results in an absolute value. But we do have bounds on u way back up here u is trapped between 0 and pi, which is in quadrant 1 and quadrant 2. So I can go ahead and drop those absolute values because of the u bounds. All right. So we're finally at a point that we can now evaluate this surface integral. So the integral that we started with since it's now been a while, as we wanted the integral over s of 1 minus x squared minus y squared ds. And our vector function was given by sine of u, cosine of v, sine of u, sine of v, and then cosine of u. Our u is trapped between 0 and pi, and v is between 0 and 2 pi. Okay. So in place of x, I need to put my x component of my surface parameterization. And then in place of y, I need to put the y component of my parametrization. So this ends up equaling a double integral. This piece becomes 1 minus that squared is sine squared of u 
cosine squared of V, then minus, that becomes sine squared of U, cosine, oh sorry, sine squared of U, sine squared of V. My hand was blocking the one I needed. And then the DS ends up becoming sine of U, and then we need to integrate with respect to U and V. So again, think we have nice bounds. The U bounds are zero to pi. The V bounds are zero to two pi. So again, this is replacing X by the vector function component. And this is replacing Y by the vector function component for Y. Okay. Now, hopefully, we can again keep using our trig formulas to condense this even more, because this is one it's not as straightforward of an integral, so I will go through it. So in this case, we have from 0 to 2 pi, from 0 to pi. Thankfully, at least, they both have this sine squared of u, so you could factor that out. And what you're left with is 1 minus sine squared of u. times cosine squared of v plus sine squared of v. And then I need to times that by sine of u and integrate with respect to u and v. So at least here, cosine squared of v plus sine squared of v is 1. So this becomes the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi, of 1 minus sine squared of u times sine of u du dv. So at least in this way, my v's are completely gone. So this is a separable function. So we can instead integrate this from 0 to 2 pi. and then do from 0 to pi with all this stuff involving sine and u. OK. First part, thankfully nice. That becomes v evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, so it's 2 pi. Now here, in order to be able to evaluate this, we have a nice little identity that we can use here. 1 minus sine squared of u is exactly cosine squared of u. So this becomes cosine squared of u sine of u du. So we can make a u sub, but you can't use the variable u because that's what we're integrating with respect to. So I have to call this something completely different. I'll go ahead and say w. If I let w be cosine of u, then dw is negative sine of u du. And so I can go ahead and just bring that minus sign over. So now we can go ahead and make the substitution. We're introducing a minus sign. We'll worry about the bounds in a minute. Cosine of u is w, so this becomes w squared dw. If you wanted to keep the bounds from 0 to pi, you cannot just write that. You would have to say these are u bounds and then go back to u to be able to evaluate these. But again, you really should just change the bounds. So working on these limits, when u is equal to 0, w is equal to cosine of 0, which is 1. When u is equal to pi, w is cosine of pi, which is negative 1. So my lower bound switch to 1, my upper bound switch to negative 1, and that's okay. We can make this order the one we want because remember, we just cancel out that minus sign. So this is 2 pi, the integral from negative 1 to 1 of w squared dw. 
So thankfully that's at least a nice antiderivative. This gives me two pi, that's w cubed over three, evaluated from negative one to positive one. So that gives me two pi over three. We end up one cubed is one, subtracting negative one. So overall, this thing ends up equaling four pi over three. So you can see these surface integrals are going to take you quite a bit of time. They tie together a lot of information that we've dealt with this semester. So the last component to these parametric surfaces and surface integrals is what happens if we do a vector field. So we know for line integrals, when we found the line integral inside a vector field, that was representing the amount of work that you would do walking along that surface. So at least in this aspect, we are going to have like a nice application of it. There is something realistic that comes. Um, but if you remember for a line integral in a vector field, you had an orientation that you walked along the path. And then depending on the orientation, if you walked it in the opposite direction, it just negated the value. So with surfaces, we also have the same idea. We're going to need to define the orientation of the surface. So ultimately, there's going to be two main types of orientation. We consider upward and downward mostly in this class. So before I can define the surface integrals of vector fields, we're going to talk about that. So we need to define oriented surfaces. So we know when we were going around a curve, it would have a direction clockwise, counterclockwise, whatever it was. We say a surface, is, which is S, is said to be orientable. if and only if its normal vectors vary continuously over the surface. Now that might be kind of a weird definition, but Basically, you're going to have two distinct sides. So at some point, your vector would switch and go in the opposite direction. So I'm going to go back up here to some of these ones that we've already done. If you think about the sphere, there's the outside of the sphere and the inside of the sphere. So at any point, if you find a normal vector, you have one that's pointing outward, and then you have the like one that's pointing inward. So it's giving the two distinct sides of the sphere. And even over here, you have one that's pointing outward and then one that's pointing inward, maybe towards the origin. And even for this surface over here, you have the outer, which points like this, and then you have the inward, which is pointing inward. So they have some kind of orientation to it. So in general, if you have a surface that looks like this, it has two sides. Up here, all your normal vectors might point like this, but we would consider these to be upward because that z direction is positive. And then you have the like ones that point in the opposite direction. So another normal vector would be down here. You got this normal vector down here, this normal vector here. So in these cases, all of the normal vectors would be negative. Okay. So orientable surfaces are going to have two sides.
Okay. So when I'm going to go and find my surface integral over a vector field, there's going to be this normal vector that dictates what the orientation of the surface is. And we'll see how do we actually figure this out. So I'm going to give you the formal definition, give you the interpretation of it, and then we're going to figure out how do I actually evaluate this thing. But again, it has that nice natural extension from line integrals. Okay. So for our formal definition, we're going to let S be a smooth oriented surface. defined by the vector function r of uv, which has x, y, and z components. Where this uv varies in some region r. And then we're going to let capital F represent our vector field, and this is going to be a continuous vector field. On this particular surface. So it's defined everywhere the surface is defined. Okay. Then given these things, the surface integral of F on the surface S is the following. So just like we had the single integral over the curve C of F dot dr, we have an analogous way to do this here. We have f dot ds, okay? And this s is now defined on this particular vector function r. So I don't have the capacity to go into full detail because it would take a lot of pictures and a lot of explanations. But thinking back to when we did line integrals, what this represented when we had a single integral of f dot dr in that case, what that did is it computed the amount of work that would happen. So here, when I bump this up to a surface and I have a vector field over that, what this is essentially calculating if f is representing a fluid field, this would be the amount of fluid that would flow over this surface over whatever given time. Okay, so the way we actually represent this ds is it ends up being a component of the normal vector. So if you have that surface and you have all of these normal vectors on it, and then you have the vector field doing whatever in whatever direction here, the way you can actually calculate the amount of fluid is by going ahead and dealing with uh, the dot product of this normal vector and that vector field because that's basically going to give you the magnitude of what's left over once the force field is acting with that. So ultimately, to actually evaluate this, what we need to do is we need to take a double integral over S of F dot, those normal vectors of the surface. And then we need to integrate with respect to the surface itself. Okay. So this n is representing the normal vectors, and specifically this is a unit vector consistent with the orientation of the surface. Okay. So another word you're often going to hear for this, especially if you're going into physics, this is also called the flux. Of 
of f across the surface s. Okay. So to give you that physical application, if we think of f as the velocity of fluid, in R3, then the flux across S is the volume of fluid crossing S per unit time. So in order to actually evaluate this, I got to figure out what does this turn into? And maybe you can think of where it's going. If you dealt with line integrals, this is R prime of T. Well, again, I've got two components to R here. So it's going to deal with the partial of R with respect to U and with respect to V. This is really going to turn into the cross product of these two. So I'm going to kind of build all of these pieces together. But again, it is going to be the next extension for line integrals to surface integrals from that 1D to 2D. So in order to evaluate this integral, we need to know what N is. So I'm going to draw a picture. Maybe here is my surface S. And again, I'm going to cut this in the direction of U and V. I don't know exactly what that is, but let's say it looks like this. Okay. And so here is that typical piece here. just blown out. Well, if I look again at that parallelogram that's sitting on top of this, this would be the derivative of R with respect to V, and this would be the derivative of R with respect to U. And my normal vector points directly straight up. And so the way we find N is by taking the cross product of these two, because okay, that always produces that vector that's orthogonal. However, this does have to be a unit vector, and I'm not guaranteed that this cross product is a unit, so I need to go ahead and divide by the magnitude of this. Put my bar a little too early. Okay. And then the ds inside my integral here is exactly the ds that I've already calculated. So since ds is equal to the magnitude of ru cross rv dA, we get the following. To evaluate this surface integral, of f dot n ds. It's going to depend on the region r defined by your parameterization. f will need to get evaluated at whatever your uh, parameterization is. n, we just figured out, is ru cross rv divided by the magnitude of that vector. And then ds is exactly this magnitude. And then we integrate with respect to u and v. 
So again, filling in those like pieces, this is the normal vector, and ds is given by this. But luckily, at least, the magnitudes just cancel each other out. So what we end up doing to evaluate the flux is we take f, and we're going to dot product it with ru cross rv. And then integrate with respect to u and v. Okay. So again, I want to make this comparison to line integrals to show you it is analogous. For a vector field, we had a curve, and we would have to evaluate f dot dr. But the way we did this was the curve was defined by two constants, a and b, for our parameter. We had to take f, and we had to evaluate it along that vector function. And then we dot product that with r prime of t and integrated with respect to t. To bump this up for a surface integral, I have a double integral now of f dot ds. Okay. And the way I actually find this is a double integral over whatever my bounds end up being. I have to take f and I need to evaluate it on that parametrization. And then I'm essentially dot producting it with the derivative, but there's two. So I need to take the cross product of this thing. The only stipulation is because this is an oriented surface, this needs to match the orientation of the surface. So I'll give you an example going through all of this. The matching the orientation, I promise, is not a major component because you're just going to check that the z component matches whatever upward or downward orientation they tell you. Let's do one example on this because our last two sections are going to cover other ways that we can go about this. Just like for line integrals, we could use Green's theorem. When we're dealing with these surface integrals, we have another way we can compute them. And then we have another theorem that we'll take a look at as well. So we're going to let f be the vector field defined by xy, yz, xc. And we're going to let s be part of the paraboloid. which is z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared that lies above the square zero 0,1 cross zero 0,1 with upward orientation. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to evaluate the surface integral for this surface. Okay. So I'm going to start by drawing a picture of what this surface looks like to help me out, to help me figure out this parametrization and figure out all of these pieces. So I'm working with a rectangle just in the xy plane. I'm only looking at the paraboloid that's above this rectangle, which goes from 0, 1 to 0, 1. So if you go ahead and graph this, 
if you plug in x and y are 0, your z value is going to equal 4. And then in each of these cases, you would have a, par a parabola coming down if you look at the traces. So in one direction, this is coming down. And then in the xy plane, or xz plane, it's coming down. And then if you plug in this point here, 1, 1, into this function, you'd see your z value is going to be 2. Basically, it'll come down like this. So this is our surface we're finding the surface integral over. This upward orientation is basically meaning that my normal vectors all have to point upward. Okay. So I want to make sure that this piece, RU cross RV, matches the fact that the normal vectors point upward. So I get to parametrize the surface. But thankfully, again, this is that nice parametrization. You can use x and y. But I'm going to stick to u and v. So we've got uv and then 4 minus u squared minus v squared. Our u is the x, our v is the y, and in this case, both of these are stuck between 1 and negative 1. Or sorry, 0 and 1. So our uv plane is just a square. So this is our region R. So I've got to find RU cross RV, so I've got to find these partials far first. Partial with respect to U is 1, 0, negative 2U. Partial with respect to V is 0, 1, negative 2V. Okay. So what ends up happening is when I go to replace this by RU cross RV, to make it match, I'm either going to use exactly that, or I use the opposite, RV cross RU. Those would find both of the normal vectors. One will point upward, one will point downwards. So just start by finding RU cross RV. And if it's not the right orientation, you just negate it because remember they go in the opposite direction. So here we're going to use RU cross RV or RV cross RU. Depending on which has upward orientation. So in this case, depending on which matches the orientation of S. But remember, once you find one, you don't need to find the other because these point in the opposite direction. So RU cross RV is the opposite of RV cross RU. So find one if it matches your golden. So I'm going to start with RU cross RV. In this one, I'll go ahead and write it out. We've got i, j, k. r, u is 1, 0, negative 2, u. r, v is this. So going through and finding this first component, we strike out first row, first column. That gives me 0 and then minus negative 2, u. So that just becomes 2u in the first component. In the second, we'd have to negate. And thankfully, at least, this is negative negative 2v, because that would be a 0. So this is 2v. And then in the z component, that gives me 1 minus 0. So my z component is 1. 
So I want upward orientation. If you think then about the Z component, the Z being positive means the normal vector is upward. So this matches our orientation. If you didn't, if you found out this was, say, negative 1, that would be downward orientation. Well, then you would just go ahead and say, we need to use RV cross RU. And you would just negate all the components. So instead, if I change this problem and just said downward orientation, this is what I would use to replace N, essentially. Okay. All right, so we're getting there. We're through most of the bulk. Our vector field, just to refresh, is x, y, y, z, x, z. Our vector function r is u, v, and then 4 minus u squared minus v squared. So plugging these into F, my X is U, my Y is V, my Y is V, my Z is 4 minus U minus V squared, my X is U, and Z is the same thing. So expanding this out, that's U, V, and then here, this would be 4v minus u squared v minus v cubed. And then 4u minus u cubed minus u v squared. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dot product it with this vector. because that is the one that matched my orientation. I need to go ahead and take this piece, which I'm going to have to squeeze. And I'm going to dot product it with 2u, 2v, 1, because this is what's going to go inside my integral. So going through that, we multiply these first pieces. So I'm going to give myself a little room. We'll put the equal sign back here. That will give me 2u squared v. And then multiplying the second pieces, every single one of those is going to get multiplied by 2v. So that gives me 8v squared minus 2 u squared v squared minus 2v to the fourth. And then we need to multiply the last two pieces, which at least is just one. So I just copy what we have down. Okay. And then we can go ahead and see, do I have anything that is alike? And looking at this, I do not believe anything <laughs> is the same. So just comparing that, u squared v, well, that's different than that, and that's different as well. I've got v squared, I've got v to the fourth, u, u cubed, none of these can be condensed. Right. So I'm going to have to integrate over this, which at least is a polynomial, but it's definitely not pretty. So to find this surface integral, we instead use that region R and we integrate over exactly this dot product we just found. And then 
we integrate with respect to u and v. And thankfully, in this case, those bounds for both are 0 to 1. And so the inside becomes the 2u squared v, 8v squared, 2u squared v squared, 2v to the fourth, 4u, u cubed, uv squared, integrated with respect to u and v. And again, to save myself from making this even longer, you can go ahead and integrate this with respect to u. You definitely can't separate it. You'll get some not pretty numbers. You can use definitely something to help you out. Setting it up is the bulk of the problem. So in turn, this integral would end up equaling 713 over 80 once you condense it. Okay. So again, take your time with these. This homework is going to take you a fair amount of time. So start on it as soon as possible. Do not wait until last second.